Section zero of Canada, the Emperor of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Laud. Preface. To recreate the shadowy figures of the heroic past, to clothe the dead once more in flesh and blood, to set the puppets of the play in life's great dramas again upon the stage of action, frankly, this may not be formal history, but it is what makes the past more real to the present day. Pictures of men and women, of moving throngs and heroic episodes, stick faster in the mind than lists of governors and arguments on treaties. Such pictures may not be history, but they breathe life into the skeletons of the past. Canada's past is more dramatic than any romance ever penned. The story of that past has been told many times and in many volumes, with far digressions on Louisiana and New England and the kingcraft of Europe. The trouble is, the story has not been told in one volume. Too much has been attempted. To include the story of New England wars and Louisiana's pioneer days, the story of Canada itself has either cramped or crowded. To the Eastern writer, Canada's history has been the record of French and English conflict. To him, there has been practically no Canada west of the Great Lakes. And in order to tell the intrigue, of European tricksters, very often the writer has been compelled to exclude the story of the Canadian people, meaning by people the breadwinners, the toilers, rather than the governing classes. Similarly, to the Western writer, Canada meant the Hudson's Bay Company. As for the Pacific Coast, it has been almost ignored in any story of Canada. Needless to say, a complete history of a country as vast as Canada, whose past in every section fairly teems with action, could not be crowded into one volume. To give even the story of Canada's most prominent episodes and actors is a matter of rigidly excluding the extraneous. All that has been attempted here in such a story. Story, not history, of the romance and adventure in Canada's nation-building as will give the casual reader knowledge of the country's past and how that past led along a trail of great heroism to the destiny of a northern empire. This volume is in no sense formal history. This will be found in it no such lists of governors with dates appended, of treaties with articles running to the fours and eights and tens, of battles grouped with dates, as have made Canadian history a nightmare to children. It is only such a story as boys and girls may read, or the hurried businessmen on the train who want to know what was doing in the past, and is mainly a story of men and women and things doing. I have not given at the end of each chapter the list of authorities customary in formal history, at the same time, it is hardly necessary to say I have dug most rigorously down to original sources for facts and of secondary authorities, from Peter Boucher, his book, to modern reprints of Champlain and Le Scarbeau. There is not any I have not consulted more or less. Especially, I am indebted to the Documentary History of New York, 16 volumes, bearing on early border wars to documents Relaf and Le Nouveau, France, Quebec, to the Canadian archives since 1866, to the special historical issues of each of the eastern provinces, and to the monumental works of Dr. Kingsford. Nearly all the places described are from frequent visits or from living on the spot. Introduction the 20th century belongs to Canada. The prediction of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, Premier of the Dominion, seems likely to have bigger fulfillment than Canadians themselves realize. What does it mean? 
Canada stands at the same place in world history as England stood in the golden age of Queen Elizabeth, on the threshold of her future as a great nation. Her population is the same, about seven million. Her mental attitude is similar, that of a great awakening, a conscientious of new strength, an exuberance of energy biting on the bit to run the race, mellowed memory of hard-won battles against tremendous odds in the past. For the future, a golden vision opening on this does too far to follow. They dreamed pretty big in the days of Queen Elizabeth, but they didn't dream big enough for what was to come, and they are dreaming pretty big up in Canada today, but it is hard to forecast the future when a nation the size of all of Europe is setting out on the career of her world history. To put it differently, Canada's position is very much the same today as the United States a century ago. Her population is about 7 million. The population of the United States was 7 million in 1810. One was a strip of isolated settlements north and south along the Atlantic seaboard. The other, a string of provinces east and west along the waterways that ramify from the St. Lawrence. Both possessed and were flanked by vast, unexploited territory the size of Russia. The United States by Louisiana, Canada by the Great Northwest. What the Civil War did for the United States, Confederation did for the Canadian provinces, welded them into a nation. The parallel need not be carried farther. If the same development follows Confederation in Canada, as followed the Civil War in the United States, the 20th century will witness the birth and growth of a world power. To no one has the future opening before Canada come at a greater surprise than to Canadians themselves. A few years ago, such a claim as the Premier would have been regarded as the effusions of the after-dinner speaker. While Canadian politicians were hoping for the honour of being accorded colonial place in the English Parliament, they suddenly awakened to find themselves a nation. They suddenly realised that history, and big history too, was in the making. Instead of Canada being dependent upon the Empire, the Empire's most far-seeing statesmen were looking to Canada for the strength of the British Empire. No longer is there a desire among Canadians for a place in the Parliament at Westminster. With a new empire of their own to develop, equal in size to the whole of Europe, Canadian public men realize they have enough to do without taking a hand in European affairs. As the different Canadian provinces came into Confederation, they were like beads on a string a thousand miles apart. First were the marine provinces, with western bounds touching the eastern bounds of Quebec. But in reality, with the settlements of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island separated from the settlements of Quebec by a thousand miles of untracked forest, only the Ottawa River separated Quebec from Ontario, but one province was French, the other English, aliens to each other in religion, language, and customs. A thousand miles of rock-bound, winter-bound wastes lay between Ontario and the scattered settlement of Red River in Manitoba. Not an interest was in common between the little province in the Middle West and her sisters to the east. Then prairie land came for a thousand miles and mountains for six hundred miles before reaching the Pacific province of British Columbia, more completely cut off from the other parts of Canada than from Mexico or Panama. In fact, it would have been easier for British Columbia to trade with Mexico and Panama than the rest of Canada. To bind these far separated patches of settlement, oases in a desert of wilds, into a nation with the object of the union known as Confederation. But a nation can live only as trades what it draws from the soil. Naturally, isolated provinces look for trade to the United States, just cross an invisible boundary. It seemed absurd that the Canadian provinces should try to trade with each other a thousand miles apart, 
rather than with the United States, a stone's throw from the door of each province. But the United States erected a tariff wall that Canada could not climb. The struggling dominion was thrown solely on herself and set about the giant task of linking the provinces together, building railroads from Atlantic to Pacific, canals to, from tide water to the Great Lakes. In actual cash, this cost Canada $400 million, not counting land grants and private subscriptions for stock, which would bring up the cost of binding the provinces together to a billion. This was a staggering burden for a country with smaller population than greater New York, a burden as big as Japan and Russia assumed for their war. But like war, expenditure was a fight for national existence. Without railroads and canals, the provinces could not have been bound together into a nation. These were Canada's pioneer days, when she was spending more than she was earning, when she was bound herself down to grinding poverty and big risks and hard tasks. It was a long pull and a hard pull, but it was a pull altogether. That was Canada's seed time. This is her harvest. That was her night work, when she toiled, when other nations slept. Now is the awakening, when the world sees what she was doing. Railroad men, farmer, miner, manufacturer, all have the same struggle, the big outlay of labor and money at first, the big risk with no profit, and the long period of waiting. Canada was laying her foundations of yesterday for the superstructure of prosperity today and tomorrow, the new empire. When one surveys the country as a whole, the facts are so big, they are be bewildering. In the first place, the area of the Dominion is within a few thousand miles of as large as all of Europe. To be more specific, you could spread the surface of Italy and Spain and Turkey and Greece and Austria over eastern Canada, and you would still have an area uncovered in the east alone bigger than the German Empire. England spread flat on the surface of eastern Canada would just serve to cover the maritime provinces nicely, leaving uncovered Quebec, which was a third bigger than Germany, Ontario, which is bigger than France, and Labrador, Ungava, which is about the size of Austria. In the west, you could spread the British Isles out flat, and you would not cover Manitoba, with their new boundaries extending to Hudson's Bay. It would take a country the size of France to cover the province of Saskatchewan, a country larger than Germany to cover Alberta, two countries the size of Germany to cover British Columbia, and the Yukon, and there would still be left uncovered the northern half of the west, an area the size of European Russia. No old world monarch from William the Conqueror to Napoleon could boast such a realm. People are fond of tracing ancestry back to feudal barons in the Middle Ages. What feudal baron of the Middle Ages or Lord of the Outer Marches was heir to such heritage as Canada may claim? Think of it. Combine all the feudary domains of the Rhine and the Danube, and you have not so vast an estate as a single western province or gather up all the estates of England's midland counties and eastern shires and borderlands, and you have not enough to fill one of Canada's inland seas, Lake Superior. If there was a population in eastern Canada equal to France, and Quebec alone would support a population equal to France, and in Manitoba equal to the British Isles, and in Saskatchewan equal to France, and Alberta equal to Germany, and British Columbia equal to Germany, ignoring Yukon, Mackenzie River, Kiwatin, and Labrador, taking only those parts of Canada where climate had been tested and lands surveyed, Canada would support 200 million people. The figures are staggering, but they are not half so improbable as the actual facts of what has taken place in the United States. America's population was acquired against hard odds. There were no railroads when the movement to America began. The only ocean goers were sailboats of slow, 
progress and great discomfort. In Europe was profound ignorance regarding America. Today all is changed. Canada begins where the United States left off. The whole world is gridironed with railroads. Fast Atlantic liners offer greater comfort to the immigrant than he has known at home. Ignorance of America has given place to almost romantic glamour. Just when the free lands of the United States are exhausted and the government is putting up bars to keep out immigrants, Canada is in a position to open her doors wide. Less than a fortieth of the entire West is inhabited. Of the great clay belt of northern Ontario, only a patch of the southern edge is populated. The same may be said of the great forest belt of Quebec. These facts are the magnet that will attract the immigrants to Canada. The United States wants no more immigrants. And the movement to Canada has begun. To her shores are thronging the hosts of the old world's dispossessed in multitudes greater than any army that ever marched to conquest under Napoleon. When the history of America comes to be written in a hundred years, it will not be the record of a slaughter field with contending nations battling for mastery or generals wading to glory knee-deep in blood. It will be an account of the most wonderful race movement, the most wonderful experiment in democracy the world has known. The people thronging to Canada for homes who are to be her nation builders are people crowded out of their homelands who haven't had room for the shoulder swing manhood and womanhood needed to carve out honorable careers. Looking at them in the streets of London or Glasgow or Dublin or Berlin, these immigrants, as the French call their royalists, whose, whom revolution drove from home, I think the word immigre is a truer description of the newcomer to Canada than the word immigrant. They are poor. They are desperately poor, so poor that a month's illness or shutdown of the factory may push them from poverty to the abyss. They are thrifty, but they can neither earn nor save enough to feel absolutely sure the hollow-eyed specter of want may not seize them by the throat. They are willing to work so eager to work that the docks and the factory gates they trample and jostle one another for the chance to work. They are the underpinnings, the underprops of an old system, these immigrants by which the masses were expected to toil for the benefit of the classes. It's all the average man or woman is good for, says the old order, just a day's wage representing bodily needs. Wait, says the new order, Give him room, give him an opportunity, give him a full stomach to pump blood to his muscles and life to his brain. Wait and see. If he fails, then let him drop to the bottom of the social pit without stop of poorhouse or help. A penniless immigrant boy arrived in New York. First he peddles peanuts, then he trades in a half-husker way whatever comes to hand and earns profits. Presently, he becomes a fur trader and vests his savings in real estate. Before that man dies, he has a monthly income equal to the yearly income of European kings. That man's name was John Jacob Astor. Or a young Scotch boy comes out on a sailing vessel to Canada. For a score of years, he is an obscure clerk at a distant trading post in Labrador. He comes out of the wilds to take a higher position as land commissioner. Presently, he is backing railroad ventures of tremendous cost and tremendous risk. Within 30 years from the time he came out of the wild penniless, the man possesses a fortune equal to the national income of European kingdoms. The man's name is Nord Strathcona. Or a hard-working coal miner immigrates to Canada. The man has brains as well as hands. Other coal miners emigrate at the same time, but this man is keen as a razor in foresight and care. From coal miner, he becomes a coal manager, from manager operator to operator owner, and dies worth a fortune that the barons of the Middle Ages would have drenched 
their countries in blood to win the man's name is james dunsmere or is it a boy clerking in a department store he immigrates when he goes back to england it is to marry a lady-in-waiting to the queen he is now known as lord mount stephen what was the secret of the success ability in the first place but in the second opportunity opportunity and room for shoulder swing to show what a man can do when keen ability and tireless energy have untrammeled freedom to do the best examples of the immigrant's success can be multiplied it is more than a mere material excess it is eternal proof that given a fair chance and a square deal and shoulder swing the boy penniless can run the race and outstrip the boy bat born to power have you then no menial classes in canada asked a member of the old order no i'm thankful to say said i then who does the work the workers but what's the difference just this your menial of the old country is a ch child of a menial whose father before him was a menial, whose ancestors were in servital positions to other people back as far as you like to go, to the time when men were serfs wearing an iron collar with the brand of the Lord who owned them. With us, no stigma is attached to work. Your menial expects to be a menial all his life. With our worker, just as sure as the sun rises and sets, if he continues to work and is no fool, he will rise to earn a competency, to improve himself, to own his own labor, to own his own house, to hire the labor of other men who are beginners as he once was himself. Then you have no social classes? Lots. The ups who have succeeded and the half-ups, halfway ups, who are succeeding and the beginners who are going to succeed and the downs who never try and as success doesn't necessarily mean money but doing the best at whatever one tries you can see that the ups and the halfway ups and the beginners and the downs have each their own classes of special workers that she answered is not democracy it is a revolution she was thinking of the old world hard and fast divisions of society into royalty aristocracy commons peasantry it is not a revolution i explained it is a rebirth when you send your emigre out to us he is a man made over man but it is not given to all emigres to become great capitalists or great leaders some who have the opportunity have not the ability and the majority who would not for all the rewards that greatness offers choose careers that entail long years of nerve-wracking unflagging labor but on a minor scale the same process of making over takes place one case will illustrate some years before immigration to canada had been become general Two or three hundred Icelanders were landed in Winnipeg destitute. From some reason, which I have forgotten, probably the quarantine of an immigrant, the Icelanders could not be housed in the government immigration hall. They were absolutely without money, household goods, property of any sort except clothing, and that was scant. The men having but one suit of the poorest clothes, the women thin homespun dresses so worn one could see many of them had no underwear. The people represented the very dregs of poverty. Withdrawing to the vacant lots in the west end of Winnipeg, at that time a mere town, the newcomers slept for the first nights herded into the rooms of an Icelander opulent enough to have rented a house. Those who could not gain admittance to the house slept under the high board sidewalks, then a feature of the new town. I remember as a child watching them sit on the high sidewalk till it was dark, then roll under. Fortunately, it was summer, 
but it was useless for people in this condition to go bare in the prairie farm to make land yield you must have had a house and barns and stock and implements, and I doubt these people had much as a jackknife. I remember how two or three of the older women used to sit crying each night in despair till they disappeared in the crowded house, fourteen or twenty of them to a room. Within a week, the men were all at work sawing wood from door to door at a dollar and a half a cord, the women out by the day washing at a dollar a day. Within a month, they had earned enough to buy lumber and tar paper. Tar papered shanties went up like mushrooms on the vacant lots. Before winter, each family had bought a cow and chickens. I shall not betray confidence by telling where the cow and chickens slept. These immigrants were not desirable neighbors. Other people moved hastily away from the region. Such a condition would not be tolerated now where there are spacious immigration halls and sanitary inspectors to see that cows and people do not house under the same roof. What with work and peddling milk, by spring the people were able to move out on the free prairie farms. Today these Icelanders own farms clear of debt, own stock that would be considered the possession of a capitalist in Iceland, and have money in the savings banks. Their sons and daughters have had university educations and have entered every avenue of life, farming, trading, practicing medicine, actually teaching English in English schools. Some are members of parliament. It was a hard beginning, but it was a rebirth to a new life. They are now among the nation builders of the West. But it would be a mistake to conclude that Canada's nation builders consist entirely of poor people. The race movement has not been a leaderless mob. Princes, nobles, adventurers, soldiers of fortune were the pathfinders who blazed the trail to Canada. Goal, glory, pure and simple, was the aim that lured the first comers across trackless seas. Adventurous young aristocrats, members of the old order, led the first nation builders to America, and all unconscious of destiny laid the foundations of the new order. The story of their adventures and work in, is the history of Canada. It is a new experience in the world's history, the race movement that has built up the United States and is now building up Canada. Our great race movement have been tearing down of high places, the upward scramble of one class on the backs of the deposed class. Instead of leveling down, Canada's nation building is leveling up. This, then, is the empire, the size of all the nations in Europe, bigger than Napoleon's wildest dreams of conquest, to which Canada has awakened. End of section zero. Recording by Linda Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Section one of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Laud. Chapter 1. 1000 to 1600. Who first found Canada? As many legends surround the beginnings of empire in the north as cling to the story of early Rome. When Leif, son of Earl Eric the Red, came down from Greenland with his Viking crew, which of his bearded seamen in Arctic furs leaned over the dragon prow for sight of the lone new land, fresh as if washed from the dews, was it Thorwald, Leif's brother, or the mother of Snorri, first white child born in America, who caught first glimpse through the flying spray of Labrador's doomed hills. Helland, place of slaty rocks, and of Nova Scotia's wooded meadows, Markland, and Rhode Island's broken vine-clad shore, Vinland? The question cannot be answered. All is as misty concerning that Viking voyage as the legends of old Norse gods. Leif, the lucky, son of Earl Eric, 
the outlaw coasts back to Greenland with his bold sea rovers. This was in the year 1000. For ten years they came riding southward in their rude plank ships of the dragon prow, those Norse adventurers, and Thorwood, Leif's brother, is first of the pathfinders in America to lose his life in battle with the Skrelegs, or Indians. Thorstein, another brother, sails south in 1005 with Gudrid, his wife, but a roaring nor'easter tears the piping sails to tatters, and Thorstein dies as his frail craft scuds before the blast. Back comes Gudrid the very next year with a new husband and a new ship and 200 colonists to found a kingdom in the land of the vine. At one place they come to rocky islands where birds flock in such myriads that it is impossible to land without trampling nests. Were these the rocky islands famous for birds in the St. Lawrence? On another coast are fields of maize and forests entangled with grapevines. Was this part of modern New England? On Vinland, wherever it was, Gudrid, the Norse woman, disembarks her colonists. All goes well for three years. Fish and fowl are in plenty. Cattle roam knee-deep in pasturage. Indians trade furs for scarlet cloth, and the Norsemen dole out their barter in strips narrow as little finger. But all beasts that roam the wilds are free game to Indian hunters. The cattle begin to disappear, the Indians to lurk armed along the paths to the water springs. The woods are full of danger. Any bush may conceal painted foe. Men as well as cattle lie dead with telltale arrow sticking from a wound. The Norsemen begin to hate these shadowy, lonely, mournful forests. They long for wild winds and trackless seas and open world. Fur clad, what do they care for the cold? Greenland with its rolling drifts is safer hunting than this forest world. What glory doom prisoners between the woods and the sea within the shadow of the great forests and the gear. The smell of wildwood things, of flower banks, of fern mold, came dank and unwholesome to these men. Their nostrils were for the whiff of the sea, and every sunset tipped the waves with fire where they longed to sail, and the shadow of the fear fell on Gudrid, ordering the vessels loaded with timber good for masts and with wealth of furs, she gathered up her people and led them from the land of the vine back to Greenland. Where was Vinland? Was it Canada? The answer is unknown. It was south of Labrador. It is thought to have been Rhode Island, but certainly passing north and south, the Norse were the first white men to see Canada. Did some legend, dim as a forgotten dream, come down to Columbus in 1492 of the Norseman western land? All sailors of Europe yearly fished in Iceland. Had one of Columbus's crew heard sailor yarns of the new land? If so, Columbus must have thought the new land part of Asia, for ever since Marco Polo had come from China. Europe had dreamed of a way to Asia by sea. What with Portugal and Spain dividing the New World, all the nations of Europe suddenly awakened to a passion for discovery. There were still lands to the north, which Portugal and Spain had not found. Lands where pearls and gold might abound. At Bristol, in England, dwelt with his sons, John Cabot, the Genoese master mariner, well acquainted with eastern trade. Henry the Seventh commissions him on a voyage of discovery, an empty honor, the king to have one-fifth of all profit, Cabot to bear all expense. The Matthew ships from Bristol with a crew of 18 in May of 1497. North and west sails the tumbling craft 2,000 miles, Colder grows the air, stiffer the breeze in the bellowing sails. 
till the Matthews crew are shivering on decks amid fleets of icebergs that drift from Greenland in May and June. This is no realm of spices and gold. Land looms through the mist the last week in June, rocky, surf-beaten, lonely as earth ends, with never a sound but the scream of gulls and the moan of the restless water fret along endless white reefs. Not a living soul did the English sailors see. Weak in numbers, disappointed in the rocky land, they did not wait to hunt for natives. An English flag was hastily unfurled and possession taken of this empire of the north for England. The woods of America for the first time rang to the chopper. The wood and water were taken on, and the Matthew had anchored in Bristol by the first week of August. Neither gold nor a way to China had Cabot found, but he had accomplished three things. He had found the New World was not part of Asia, as Spain thought. He had found the continent itself, and he had given England the right to claim New Dominion. England went mad over Cabot. He was granted the title of admiral and allowed to dress in silks as a nobleman. King Henry gave him ten pounds, equal to five hundred dollars of modern money, and a pension of twenty pounds, equal to one thousand dollars today. It is sometimes said that modern writers attribute an air of romance to these old pathfinders, which they would have scorned, but Juan Cabot, as the people called him, won the halo of glory with glee. To his barber he presented an island kingdom. To a poor monk he gave a bishopric. His son, Sebastian, sailed out the next year with a fleet of six ships and 300 men, coasting as far as Greenland, south as far as Carolina, so rendering double secure England's title to the north and bringing back news of the great cod banks that were to lure French and Spanish and English fishermen to Newfoundland for hundreds of years. Where was Cabot's landfall? I chanced to be in Bonavista Bay, Newfoundland, shortly after the 400th anniversary of Cabot's voyage. King's Cove, landlocked as a hole in the wall, mountains meeting skyline, presented one flat rock in letters the size of a house claim that it was here John Cabot sent his sailors ashore to plant the flag on Cairn of Boulders. But when I came back from Newfoundland by way of Cape Breton, I found the same claim there. For generations, the tradition has been handed down from father to son among Newfoundland fisher folk that as Cabot's vessel, pitching and rolling to the tidal bore, came scudding into King's Cove, rock girt as an island lake, the sailors shouted, Bonavista, beautiful view. But Cape Breton has her legend too. It was Cabot's report of the cod banks that brought the Breton fishermen out, whose name Cape Breton bears. As Christopher Columbus spurred England to action, so Cabot now spurred Portugal and Spain and France. Gaspar Cortiel comes in 1500 from Portugal on Cabot's tracks to the land of slaty rocks, which the Norse saw long ago. The Gulf Stream beats the iron coast with a boom of thunder and the tide scroll meets the ice drift, and it isn't a land to make a treasure hunter happy till there wander down to the shore Montane Indians, strapping fellows, a head taller than the tallest Portuguese. Cortillo lands, lures 50 savages on board, carries them home as slaves for, for Portugal's galley ships, and names the country Land of Laborers. Labrador. He sailed again the next year, but never returned to Portugal. The seas swallowed his vessel, or the tide beat it to pieces against Labrador's rocks. Of those Indians, slack their vengeance by cutting the throats of master and crew. And Spain was not idle. In 1513, Balboa leads his Spanish treasure seekers across the Isthmus of Panama 
discovers the Pacific and realizes what Cabot has already proved, that the New World is not part of Asia. Thereupon, in swelling words, he takes possession of earth, air, and water from the Pole Arctic to the Pole Antarctic for Spain. A few years later, Magellan finds his way to Asia round South America, but this path by sea is too long. From France, Normans and Bretons are following Cabot's tracks to Newfoundland, to Labrador, to Cape Breton. Quahar men goeth a fishing in a little cockshell boat, no bigger than three masted schooner, with black painted dories dragging in tow or rope to the rolling decks. Absurd it is, but with no blare of trumpets or royal commissions, with no guide but the wander spirit that lured the old Vikings over the rolling seas, these grizzled peasants flock from France, cross the Atlantic, and scatter over what were then chartless waters from the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the Grand Banks. Just as they may have seen today bounding over the waves in their little black dories, hauling in, hauling in the endless line or jigging for squid or lying at ease at the noonday hour singing some old land ballad while the kettle of cod and pork boils above a chip fire kindled on the stones used as ballast in their boats, so came the French fisher folk three years later after Cabot had discovered the Grand Banks. Denny of Honfleur has led his fishing fleet all over the Gulf of St. Lawrence by 1506. So has Albert de Dapp by 1517. Fifty French vessels yearly fish off the coast of Newfoundland. By 1518, one Baron de Lyrie has formed the project of colonizing this new domain. But the Baron's ship unluckily came from the Grand Banks to port on that circular bank of sand known as Sable Island, from 20 to 30 miles as the tide shifts the sand, with grass waist-high and swampy lake in the middle. The Baron de Leary unloads his stock on Sable Island and roves the sea for a better port. The King of France, meanwhile, resents the Pope dividing the New World between Spain and Portugal. I should like to see the clause in Father Adam's will that gives the whole earth to you, he sent word to his brother kings. Baranzo, sea rover of Florence, is commissioned to explore the New World seas, but Baranzo goes no farther north in 1524 than Newfoundland, and when he comes on a second voyage, he is lost. Some say hanged as a pirate by the Spaniards for intruding on their seas. In spite of the loss of the king's sea rover, the fisher folk of France continue coming in their crazy little schooners, continue fishing in the fogs of the Grand Banks from their rocking black plank dories, continue scudding for shelter from the storm. Here, there, everywhere, into the south shore of Newfoundland, into the long arms of the sea at Cape Breton, died at sundawn and sunset by such floods of golden light. These arms of the sea become known as Brass d'Or Lakes, lakes of gold, into the rock-girt lagoons of Gaspé, into the holes in the wall of Labrador, till there presently springs up a secret trade in furs between the fishing fleet and the Indians. The King of France is not to be balked by one failure. What, he said, are my royal brothers to have all America? Among the bank fishermen were many sailors of St. Malo. Jacques Carchet, master pilot, now forty years of age, must have learned strange yarns of the New World. From harbor folk. Indeed, he may have served as a sailor on the banks. Him the king chose, with 120 men and two vessels, in 1534, to go on a voyage of discovery to the great sea where men fished. 
Cartier was to find if the sea led to China and to take possession of the countries for France. Captain, masters, men, march to the cathedral and swear fidelity to the king. The vessels sail on April 20th with the fishing fleet. Piping winds carry them forward at a quicker pace. The sails scatter and disappear over the watery skyline. In 20 days, Carchet is off that bold headland with the hole in the wall called Bona Vista. Ice is running as always runs there in spring. What with wind and ice, Carchet deems it prudent to look for shelter. Shearing south among the scarps at Catalina, where the whales blow and the seals float in thousands ah, on the ice pans, Carchet anchors to take on wood and water. For ten days he watches the white whirl driving south. Then the water clears and his sails swing to the wind, and he is off to the north along that steel gray shore of rampart rock between the white slab islands and the reefy coast. Birds are in such flocks off Funk Island that the men go ashore to hunt, and the fisher folks anchor for bird shooting today. Higher rises the rocky skyline, barer the shore wall, with never a break to the eye till you turn some jagged peak and come on one of those snug coves where the white fisher hamlets now nestle. Reefs white as lace fret line the coast. Lonely as death, bare as a block of marble, Gulf Island is passed where another crew in later years perish as castaways. Gray finback whales flounder in schools, the lazy humpbacks lounge round and round the ships, eyeing the keels curiously. A polar bear is seen on an ice pan. Then the ships come to the lonely harbors north of Newfoundland. Brigitte and Quirpoon and Haha Bay, rock girt, treeless, always windy, desolate, and eternal moaning of the tide over the fretful reef. To the north, off a little seaward, is Belle Isle. Here, storm or calm, the ocean tide beats with fury, unceasing and weird, retching of baffled waters like the scream of lost souls. It was sunset when I was on a coastal ship once that anchored off Belle Isle, and I realized how natural it must be for Carchet's superstitious sailors to mistake the moan of the sea for wild cries of distress and the smoke of the spray for fires of the inferno. To French sailors, Belle Isle became Isle of Demons. In the half-light of fog or night, as the wave washes, rises, and falls, you can almost see white arms clutching the rock. As usual, bad weather caught the ships in Belle Isle Straits. Till the 9th of June, brown fog held Cartier. When it lifted, the tide had borne his ships across the straits to Labrador at Castle Island, Chateau Bay. Labrador was a ruder region than Newfoundland. Far as I could scan were only domed rocks like petrified billows, dank valleys, moss-grown and scrubby, hillsides bare as slate. This land should not be called Earth, remarked Carchet. It is Flint, Faith. I think this is the region God gave Cain. If this were Cain's realm, his descendants were men of might, for when the Montanay, tall and straight as mast poles, came down to the straits, Carchet's little scrub sailors thought them giants. Promptly, Carchet planted the cross and took possession of Labrador for France. As the boats coasted westward, the shore rock turned to sand. Huge banks and drifts and hillocks of white sand, so that the place where the ship struck across the south shore became known as Blank Salbon, white sand. Squalls drove Carchet up the Bay of Islands on the west shore of Newfoundland, and he was amazed to find this arm of the sea cut the big island almost in two. 
wooded mountains flanked each shore a great river amber with forest mold came rolling down a deep gorge but it was not newfoundland carchet had come to explore it was the great inland sea to the west and to the west he sailed july found him off another kind of coast new brunswick forested and rolling with fertile meadows down a broad shallow stream the miramichi paddled indians waving furs for trade but wind threatened a stranding in the shallows Carchet turned to follow the coast north. Denser grew the forest, broader the girths of the great oaks, heavier the vines, hotter the midsummer weather. This was no land of Cain. It was a new realm for France. While Carchet lay at anchor north of the Miramichi, Indian canoes swarmed round the boats, such close quarters the whites had to discharge a musket to keep the three hundred savages from scrambling on decks. Two seamen then landed to leave presents of knives and coats. The Indians shrieked delight, and following back to the ships, threw fur garments to the decks till literally naked. On the 18th of July, the heat was so intense that Cartier named the waters Bay of Chaleur. Here were more Indians. At first, the women dashed to hiding in the woods, while the painted warriors paddled out. But when Carchet threw more presents into the canoes, women and children swarmed out singing a welcome. The Bay of Chaleur promised no passage west, so Carchet again spread his sails to the wind and coasted northward. The forest thinned. Toward Gaspé, the shore became rocky and fantastic. The island sea led westward but the season was far advanced it was decided to return and report to the king landing at gaspe on july twenty fourth cartier erected a cross thirty feet high with the words emblazoned on a tablet vivre le roi de france standing above him were the painted natives of the wilderness one old chief dressed in black bearskin gesticulating protest against the cross till Cartier explained by signs that the whites would come again. Two savages were invited on board. By accident or design, as they stepped on deck, their skiff was upset and set adrift. The astonished natives found themselves in the white man's power, but food and gay clothing allied fear. They willingly consented to accompany Cartier to France. Somewhere north of Gaspé, the smoke of the French fishing fleet was seen ascending from the sea and the fishermen rocked in their dories cooking the midday meal august ninth prayers are held for safe return at blank sabon port of the white white stand and by september fifth carchet is home in st malo a rabble of grisly sailor folk chattering a welcome from the wharf front he had not found passage to China, but he had found a kingdom, and the two Indians told marvelous tales of the great river to the west, where they lived, of mines, of vast unclaimed lands. End of section one. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section two of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Laud. Section 2, from 1000 to 1600, Part 2. Carchet had been home only a month when the admiral of France ordered him to prepare for another voyage. He himself was to command the Grand Hermine, Captain Jal Le Bair, the Little Hermine, and Captain Le Breton, the Elmeron. Young gentlemen adventurers were to accompany the explorers. The ships were provisioned for two years, and on May 16, 1535, all hands gathered to the cathedral where sins were confessed 
the archbishop's blessing received and Carche given a godspeed to the music full of choirs chanting invocation three days later anchors were hoisted cannon boomed sails swung out the vessels sheered away from the roadstead while cheers rent the air headwinds held the ship back furious tempests scattered the fleet it was july seventeenth before Carche sighted the gall islands of newfoundland and swung up north with the tide through the brown fogs of belle isle straits to the shining gravel of blank sabon here he waited for the other vessels which came on the twenty sixth the two indians taken from gaspe now began to recognize the headlands of their native country telling Cartier the first kingdom along the great river was Saguenay, the second canada the third hochelaga Cartier anchored to claim the land for france and he named the great water st lawrence because it was on that saint's day he had gone ashore the north side of anticosti was passed and the first of september saw the three little ships drawn up within the shadow of that somber gorge cut through sheer rock where the sanguinet rolls sullenly out to the st lawrence the mountains presented naked rock wall beyond rolling back rolling back to the impenetrable wilderness through the canyon flowed the river dark and ominous and hushed the men rowed out in small boats to fish but were afraid to land as the ships advanced up the st lawrence the seamen could scarcely believe they were on a river the current rolled seaward in a silver flood in canoes paddling shyly out from the north shore Carchet's two indians suddenly recognized old friends and whoops of delight set the echoes ringing keeping close to the north coast russet in the september sun Carchet slipped up that long reach of shadows abreast a low-shored wooded island so laden with great vines he called it isle bacchus it was the island of orleans then the ships rounded westward and there burst to view against the high rocks of the north shore the white plumed shimmering cataract of montmorency leaping from precipice to riverbed with roar of thunder cartier had anchored near the west end of orleans island when there came paddling out with twelve canoes donaconda great chief of stadaconda whose friendship was won on the instant by the tales Carchet's indians told of france and all the marvels of the white man's world Carchet embarked with several young officers to go back with the chief and the three vessels were, were cautiously piloted up the st charles river which joins the st lawrence below the modern city of quebec women dashed to their knees in water to welcome ashore these gaily dressed newcomers with the gold braided coats and clanking swords crossing the low swamp now lower town quebec the adventurers followed a path through the forest up a steep declivity of sliding stones to the clear high table land above and on up the rolling slopes to the airy heights of cape diamond overlooking the st lawrence like the turret of some castle above the sea did a french soldier removing his helmet to wipe away the sweat of his arduous climb cry out quebec what a peak as he viewed the magnificent panorama of river and valley and mountain rolling from his feet or did their indian guide point to the water of the river narrowing like a strait below the peak and mutter in native tongue quebec the strait legend gives both explanations of the name to the east Carchet could see far down the silver flood of the st lawrence halfway to Saguenay. to the south far as the dim mountains of modern new hampshire what would the king of france have thought if he could have realized that his adventurers had found a province three times the size of england one-third larger than france one-third larger than germany 
and they had as yet reached only one small edge of Canada, namely Quebec. Heat haze of Indian summer trembled over the purple hills. Below, the river quivered like quicksilver. In the air was the nutty odor of dry grasses, the clear tang of coming frosts, crystal to the taste as water, and if one listened, almost listened to the science, one could hear above the lapping of the tide the far echo of the cataract. To Cartier, the scene might have been the airy fabric of some dream world, but out of dreams of earth's high heroes are empires made. But the Indians had told of that other kingdom, Hochulaga. Hither Cartier had determined to go, when three Indians dressed as devils, faces black as coals, heads in masks, brows adorned with elk horns, came gyrating and howling out of the woods on the mountainside, making wild signals to the white men encamped on the St. Charles. Cartier's interpreters told him this was a warning from the Indian god not to ascend the river. The god said, Hochilaga was a realm of snow where all white men would perish. It was a trick to keep the white men's trade for themselves. Cartier laughed. Tell them their god is an old fool, he said. Christ is to be our guide. The Indians wanted to know if Cartier had spoken to his god about it. No, answered Cartier. Then not to be floored, he added, but my priest has. With three cheers, 50 young gentlemen sheared out on September 19th from the St. Charles on the em Emerillion to accompany Cartier to Hochelaga. Beyond Quebec, the St. Lawrence widened like a lake. September frosts had painted the maples in flame. Songbirds, the glory of the St. Lawrence Valley, were no longer to be heard, but the waters literally swarmed with duck and the forests were alive with partridge. Where today nestled church spires and whitewashed hamlets were the birch wigwams and night campfires of Indian hunters. Whenever Cartier went ashore, Indians rushed knee-deep to carry him from the river, and one old chief at Richelieu signified his pleasure by presenting the whites with two Indian children. Zigzagging leisurely, now along the north shore, now along the south, pausing to hunt, pausing to explore, pausing to powwow with the Indians, the adventures came on September 28th to the reedy shallows and breeding grounds of wild fowl at Lake St. Peter. Here they were so close ashore, the Imeron caught her keel in the weeds, and the explorers left her aground under guard and went forward in rowboats. Was this the way to Hochelaga? The rowers asked Indians paddling past. Yes, three more sleeps, the Indians answered by the sign of putting the face with closed eyes three times against their hand. Three more sleeps would bring Cartier to Hochelaga, and on the night of the 2nd of October, the rowboats, stopped by the rapids, pulled ashore at Hochelaga amid a concourse of a thousand amazed savages. It was too late to follow the trail through the darkening forest to the Indian village. Cartier placed the soldiers in their burnished armor on guard and spent the night watching the council fires gleam from the mountain. And did some soldier standing sentry, watching the dark shadow of the hill creep longer as the sun went down, cry out, Mont Royal, so that the place came to be known as Montreal? At the peep of dawn, when the mist is still smoking up from the river, Cartier marshals 20 seamen with officers in military line and to the call of trumpet, marches along the forest trail behind Indian guides for the tribal fort. Following the river, knee-deep in grass, 
the french ascend the hill now known as notre dame street disappear in the hollow where flows a stream modern craig street then climb steeply through the forests to the plain now known as the great thoroughfare of sherbrooke street halfway up they come on open fields of maize or indian corn here messengers welcome them forward women singing tom-tom beating urchins stealing fearful glances through the woods the trail ends at a fort with triple palisades of high trees walls separated by ditches and roofed for defense with one carefully guided narrow gate inside are fifty large wigwams the oblong bark houses of the huron iroquois each fifty feet long with the public square in the center or what we would call the courtyard it needs no trick of fancy to call up the scene the winding of the trumpet through the forest silence the amazement of the indian drummers the arrested frenzy of the dancers the sunrise turning burnished armor to fire the clanking of swords the wheeling of the soldiers as they fall in place helmets doffed round the council fire women swarm from the long houses children come running with mats for seats bedridden blind maimed are carried on litters if only they may touch the garments of these wonderful beings one old chief with skin like crinkled leather and body gnarled with woes of a hundred years throws his most precious possession a headdress at cartier's feet poor cartier is perplexed he can but read aloud from the gospel of st john and pray christ heal these supplicants then he showers presents on the indians gleeful as children knives and hatchets and beads and tin mirrors and little images and a crucifix which he teaches them to kiss again the silver trumpet peals through the isled woods again the swords clank and the adventurers take their way up the mountain in mont royal says cartier the mountain is higher than the one at quebec vaster the view vaster the purple mountains the painted forests the valleys bounded by a skyline that recedes before the explorer as the rainbow runs from the grasp of a child this is not cafe it is a new france before going back to Quebec, the adventurers follow a trail up the St. Lawrence, far enough to see that Lachine Rapids Bar progress by boat, far enough, too, to see that the Gaspé Indians had spoken truth when they told of another grand river, the Ottawa, coming in from the north. By the 11th of October, Cartier is at Quebec. His men have built a palisaded fort on the banks of the St. Charles. The boats are beached. Indians scatter to their far hunting grounds. Winter sets in. Canadian cold is new to these Frenchmen. They huddle indoors instead of keeping vigorous with exercise. Ice hangs from the dismantled masts. Drifts heap almost to top of palisades. Fear of the future falls on the crew. Will they ever see France again? Then scurvy breaks out. The fort is prostrate. Karshi is afraid to ask aid of the wandering Indians, lest they learn his weakness. To keep up show of strength, he has his men fire off muskets, batter the fort walls, march and drill and tramp and stamp. Through twenty-five lie dead, and only four are able to keep on their feet. The corpses are hidden in snowdrifts or crammed through ice holes in the river with shot weighted to their feet. In desperation, Cartier calls on all the saints in the Christian calendar. He erects a huge crucifix and orders all, well and ill, out in procession. Weak and hopeless, they move across the snow chanting psalms that night one of the young noblemen died 
Toward spring, an Indian was seen apparently recovering from the same disease. Cartier asked him what had worked the cure and learned of the simple remedy of brewed spruce juice. By the time the Indians came from the winter hunt, Cartier's men were in full health. Up in Hochikalaga, a chief had seized Cartier's gold-handled dagger and pointed up the Ottawa whence came ore like the gold handle. Failing to carry any minerals home, Cartier felt he must have witness to his report. The boats are rigged to sail. Chief Donna Conda and eleven others are lured on board, surrounded, forcibly seized, and treacherously carried off to France. May 6, 1536. The boats leave Quebec, stopping only for water at St. Pierre, where the Breton fishermen have huts. July 16th, the anchor at St. Malo. Did France realize that Carchet had found a new kingdom? Not in the least, but the homeland gave heed to that story of minerals and had the kidnapped Indians baptized. Donaconda and all his fellow captives, but the little girl of Richou, die. And Sieur de Roberval is appointed Lord Parmont of Canada to equip Carchet with five vessels and scour the jails of France for colonists. Though the colonists are convicts, the convicts are not criminals. Some have been convicted for their religion, some for their politics. What with politics and war, it is May 1541 before the ships sail, and then Roberval has to wait another year for his artillery while Carchet goes ahead to build the forts. From the first, things go wrong. Headwinds prolong the passage for three months. The stock on board is reduced to a diet of cider, and half the cattle die. Then the Indians of Quebec ask awkward questions about Donaconda. Carchet flounders midway between truth and lie. Donaconda had died, he said. As for the others, they have become as white men. Agona succeeds Donaconda as chief. Agonda is so pleased at the news that he gives Carchet a suit of buckskin garnished with wampum, but the rest of the Indians draw off in such resentment that Carchet deems it wise to build his fort at a distance and sails nine miles up to Cape Rouge, where he constructs Bourg Royal. Noel, his nephew, and Jalbor, his brother-in-law, take two ships back to France. While Carchet roams exploring, Beaupare commands Bourg Royal. In his roamings, Ever with his eyes to earth for minerals, he finds stones specked with mica and false diamonds, whence the height above Quebec is called Cape Diamond. It is enough. The crews spend the year loading ships with cargo of worthless stones and set sail in May, high of hope for wealth, great as Spaniard carried from Peru. June 8th, the ships slip into St. John's, Newfoundland for water. Seventeen fishing vessels rock to the tide inside the landlocked lagoon, and who comes gliding up the narrows of the harbor neck but Viceroy Roberval, mad with envy when he hears of the diamond cargoes. He breaks the head of a Portuguese or two among the fishing fleet and forthwith orders Cartier back to Quebec. Cartier shifts anchor from the too close range of Roberval's guns and says nothing. At dead of night, he slips anchor altogether and steals away on the tide, with only one little noiseless sail up on each ship through the dark narrows. Once outside, he spreads his wings to the wind and is off for France. The diamonds prove worthless, but Carchet receives a title and retires to Seigneurial Mansion at St. Malo. The episode did not improve Roberval's temper. The new viceroy was a soldier and a martinet, 
and his authority had been defied. With his 200 colonists taken from the prisons of France, commanded by young French officers, a lament and a La Salle among others, he proceeded up the coast of Newfoundland to enter the St. Lawrence by Belle Isle. Among his people were women, and Robert Val himself was accompanied by a niece, Marguerite, who had the reputation of being a bold horseman and prime favorite with the grands who frequent her uncle's castle. Perhaps Robert Val had brought her to New France to break up her attachment for a soldier or the viceroy may have been entirely ignorant of the romance, but, anchored off Belle Isle, Isle of Demons, the angry governor made an astonishing discovery. The girl had a lover on board, a common soldier, and the two openly defied his indirect. Coming after Carchet's defection, the incident was oil to fire with Robert Bell. Sailors were ordered to lower the rowboat. One would fain believe that the tyrannical viceroy offered the high-spirited girl at least the choice of giving up her lover. She was thrust into the rowboat with a faithful old Norman nurse. Four guns and a small supply of provisions were tossed to the boat. The sailors were then commanded to row ashore and abandon her on the Isle of Demons. The soldier lover leaped over decks and swam through the surf to share her fate. The Isle of Demons, with its wailing tides and surf-beaten reefs, is a desolate enough spot in modern days when superstitions do not add to its terrors. The wind pipes down from Labrador in fairest weather with weird voices as of wailing ghosts and in winter the shores of Belle Isle never cease to echo to the hollow booming of the pounding surf. Out of driftwood the castaways constructed a hut. Fish were in plenty, wild fowl offered easy mark, and in springtime the ice floes brought down the seal herds. There was no lack of food, but rescue seemed forever impossible, for no fishing craft would approach the demon-haunted isle. A year passed, two years, a child was born, the soldier lover died of heartbreak and despondency. The child wasted away, the old nurse too was buried. Marguerite was left alone to fend for herself and hope against hope that some of the passing sails would heed her signals. No wonder at the end of the third year she began to hear shrieking laughter in the lonely cries of tide and wind and to imagine that she saw fiendish arms snatching through the spoon of storm drift. Towards the fall of 1545, one calm day when spray for the once did not hide the island, some fishermen in the straits noticed the smoke of a huge bonfire ascending from Isle Demons. Was it a trick of the fiends to lure men to wreck, or some sailors like themselves signaling distress? The boat drew fearfully near and nearer. A creature in the strange attire of skins from wild beasts ran down the rocks, signaling frantically. It was a woman. Terrified and trembling, the sailors plucked up the courage to land. Then, for the first time, Marguerite Robert spirit gave way. She could not speak. She seemed almost bereft of reason. It was only after the fishermen had nourished her back to semblance of womanhood that they drew from her the story. On returning to France, Marguerite Robardel entered a convent. It was there an old court friend of her chateau days sought her out and heard the tale from her own lips. A colony began under such ill omen was not likely to prosper. Robardel had proceeded to Cape Rouge, where he landed in July, and before winter had a respectable fort constructed. Fifty of the colonists died of scurvy. As many as six were hanged in a single day for insubordination, and the whipping post became the emblem of authority that trembled in the balance. Robert Val, in troth, was not thinking of the colony. He was thinking of those minerals which the Indians said were at the headwaters of the Saguenay. 
leaving thirty women at the fort he ascended the saguenay with seventy men in spring and explored as far as lake st john where the village of robberville commemorates his feat but he found no minerals and lost eight men running rapids when cartier came out in fifteen forty three robberville took the remaining colonists home a profoundly embittered man legend has it that he either perished on a second voyage in fifteen forty nine or was assassinated in paris so falls the curtain on the first attempt to colonize canada end of section two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section three of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott. From 1600 to 1607. Part 1. The second attempt to plant a French colony in the New World was more disastrous than the first. Though my lord Roberval fails, the French fishing vessels continue to bound over the billows of the Atlantic to the New World. By 1578, there are 150 French fishing vessels off Newfoundland alone. The fishing folk engage in barter. Carchet's heirs ask for a monopoly of the fur trade in Canada, but the grant is so fiercely opposed by the merchants of the coast towns that it is revoked until the Marquis de la Roche, who has been a page at the French court, again obtains monopoly, with many high-sounding titles as governor and the added obligation that he must colonize the new land. What with wars and court intrigue, it is 1598 before the governor of Canada is ready to sail. Of his 200 people taken from jails, all but 60 have obtained their freedom by paying a ransom. With these 60, La Roche follows the fishing fleet out to the Grand Banks, then rounds southwestward for a milder clime where he may winter his people. Straight across the ship's course lies the famous sand bank, the graveyard of the Atlantic, what the old navigators called the dreadful isle, Sable Island. The sea lies placid as glass between the crescent horns of the long, low reefs, 30 miles from horn to horn, with never a tree to break the swale of the grass waist high. The Marquis lands his 60 colonists to fish for supplies, while he goes on with the crew to find place for settlement. Barely has the topsail dipped over the watery sky before breakers begin to thunder on the sand reefs. Air and earth lash to fury. Sails are torn from the ship of the Marquis. His masts go overboard and the vessel is driven, helpless as a chip in a maelstrom, clear back to the ports of France. Here double misfortune awaits La Roche. His old patrons of the court are no longer powerful. He is thrown in prison by a rival baron. In vain, the colonists strain tired eyes for a sail at sea. Days became weeks, weeks, months, summer, autumn, and no boat came back. As winter gales assailed the sea, sending the sand drifting like spray, the convicts built themselves huts out of driftwood and scooped beds for themselves in the earth like rabbit burrows. Of food there was plenty. The people had their fishing lines, and the stock, left by Baron de Lury long ago, had multiplied and now overran the island. Wild fowl, too, teemed on the island lake, and foxes, which must have drifted ashore on the ice float of spring, ran wild through the sedge. Like Robinson Crusoe, cast on a desert isle, the desperate people fought their fate. Traps were set for foxes, snares for the birds, and scouts kept tramping from end to end of the island for sight of a sail. Racked with despair and anxiety, these outcasts of civilization soon fell to bitter quarreling. Traps 
were found rifled. Dead men lay beside the looted traps, and doubtless not a few men lost their lives in spring when the ice floes drifted down with seal herds, and the man gave mad chase from ice pan to ice pan for seal pets to make clothing. Spring wore to summer. The graves on the sand bank increased. For a second winter, the dreary snowfall wrapped the island in a mantle white as death sheet. Then came the same weary monotony, the frenzied seal hunt over the blood-stained floes, the long summer days with the drone of the tide on the sandbanks, the men mad with hope at sight of a sail peak over the far wave tops, only to be plunged in despair as the fisherboat passed too far for a signal, the fading of the grasses to russet in the sad autumn light then snowfall again, and despair. Five years passed before La Roche could aid his people, and the pilot who went to their rescue won himself immortal contempt by robbing the castaways of their furs. Word of the rescue came to the ears of the court. Royalty commanded the refugees brought before the throne. Only twelve had survived, and these marched before the royal presence, clothed in the skins of seals, hair unkempt, beards to mid-waist, like river gods of yore, says the old record. The king was so touched that he commanded fifty crowns given to each man and the stolen furs restored. La Roche died of chagrin. While France is trying to colonize Canada, England has not forgotten that John Cabot first coasted these northern shores and erected the English flag. About the time that Marguerite Roberval was left on the Isle of Demons. Two boys, half-brothers, were playing on the sands of the English Channel, sailing toy boats and listening to sailor yarns of loot on the Spanish main. One was Humphrey Gilbert, the other Walter Raleigh. These two were destined to lead England's first colonies to America. Martin Frobisher had already poked the prows of English ships into the icy straits of Greenland waters, seeking way to China. He had come out with a fleet of 15 sails and 100 mariners in 1578 to found colonies, but was led away by the lure of fool's gold. Loading his vessels with worthless rocks, which he believed contained gold enough to suffice all the gold gluttons of the world, he sailed back to England without leaving the trace of a colony. Francis Drake, the very same year, had for the first time plowed an English furrow around the seas of the world, chasing Spanish treasurer boats up the west coast of South America and loading his own vessel with loot to the waterline. Afraid to go back the way he had come, round South America, where all the Spanish frigates lay in wait to catch him, Drake pushed on up the west coast as far as California, and landing, took possession of what he called New Albion for Queen Elizabeth, but still no colony had been planted for England. Gilbert and Raleigh, the two half-brothers, were both zealous for glory. Both stood high in court favor. Both had fought for Queen Elizabeth in the wars. Gilbert had fame as seaman and geographer. He asked for the privilege of founding England's first colony. The queen will incur no expense. Gilbert and Raleigh and their friends will fit out the vessels. Elizabeth deeds to Gilbert all that old domain discovered by John Cabot, reserving only one-fifth of the minerals he may find, and she sends him a present of a golden anchor as a godspeed. June 11, 1583, Sir Humphrey set sail with a fleet of three splendid merchantmen, fitted out as men of war and two heavily armed little frigates. The crews number 360 men, but they are for the most part impressed seamen and riotous. The fleet is only well away when the biggest of the merchantmen signals that plague has broken out and flees back to England. Later, as fog hides the boats from one another, the pirate crew on board the little frigate Swallow run down an English fisherman on the Grand Banks, board her, 
and at bayonet point loot the schooner from stem to stern when the ships lower sail to come in on the tide through long narrows to the rock girt harbor of st john's newfoundland the hundreds of fishing vessels lying at anchor there object to the pirate swallow but sir humphrey reads his commission from the queen and the fishing fleet's roars a welcome that sets the rocks ringing sunday august fourth the next day after entering the scans and french and portuguese and english send their new governor tribute in provisions fish from the english marmalade and wines and spices from the foreigners the admiral gives a feast to the master mariners each week he is in port and entertains as the old wrecker says right bountifully wandering round the rocky harbor high up the cliff to the left where remnants of a fortress may be seen today along the circular hills to the right where the fishing stages cover the waterfront gilbert's men find fool's gold rock with specks of iron and mica daniel the refiner of metals declares it is a rich specimen of silver the find goes to sue humphrey's head he sees himself a second francis drake ships crammed with gold when the captains of the other vessels in his fleet would see the treasure he answers content yourselves it is enough i have seen it but i would have no speech made of it in harbor for the portuguese and the biscayans and french might learn of it we shall soon return hither again many of the men are in ill health gilbert decides to send the invalids home in the swallow but he transfers the bold pirate crew of the frigate to the big ship delight which carries provisions for the colony while planning to make st john's the headquarters of his new kingdom sir humphrey wishes to explore those regions where Cartier had gone and whence the fishing schooners bring such wealth in furs. August 20th, the remainder of his fleet rounds out of St. John's Northwest for the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The Delight with provisions, the Golden Hind with the majority of the people, Little Frigate Squirrel weighed down by artillery stores but under command of Gilbert himself, because the smaller ship can run close ashore to explore. To keep up the spirits of the men, there is much merrymaking. Becalmed off Cape Breton, Sir Humphrey visits the big ship Delight, where the trumpets and the drums and the pipes and the cornets reel off wild sailor jigs. There was, says the old record, little watching for danger. Wednesday, August 26th, the sounding line forewarned the reefs of Sable Island. Breakers were sighted. The delight signaled that her captain wanted to shift southwest to deeper water, but Gilbert wanted to enter the St. Lawrence and signaled back to go on northwest. That night, a storm raged. The provision ship ran full tilt into the sandbanks of Sable Island and was battered into chips before the other ships could come to rescue. All supplies were lost, and all the pirate crew perished but sixteen, who jumped into the pinnace dragging astern, and, with only one oar, half punted, half drifted for seven days, till the wave wash carried them to the shores of Newfoundland. There they were picked up by a fishing vessel. With provisions gone, Sir Humphrey Gilbert's colony was doomed. He must turn back. Saturday, August 31st, they reversed the course. When halfway across the Atlantic, the admiral rode from the little squirrel across to the Golden Hind to have a lame foot treated by the surgeon. Cheer up, he urged the men. Next year, Her Majesty will loan me 1,000 pounds, and we shall come again. As storm was gathering, the men begged him to remain on the larger ship, but Gilbert refused to leave the sailors of the squirrel. The frigate was as safe for him as for them he said someone called the attention to the fact that the frigate was outweighed with cannon gilbert laughed all danger to scorn soon afterwards the waves began to break short and high a dangerous sea for small overweighted ship 
It had been arranged that both ships would swing lanterns fore and aft to keep each other in sight at night. On the night of September 9th, a phosphorescent light was seen to gleam above the main mask of the squirrel, certain sign to the superstitious sailors of dire disaster. But when the hind slackened speed and the great waves threw the vessels almost together, there was Sir Humphrey sitting aloft, book in hand, shouting out, We are as near heaven by sea as by land. The hind fell to the rear. The scroll led way, her stern lanterns lighting a trail across the shiny dark of the temperous billows. Suddenly, at midnight, the guiding light was lost. The squirrel's stern lanterns were seen to descend the pitching trough of a mountain wave, and when the wall of water fell, no light came up. Down into the abyss the little craft had plunged, never to rise again, carrying explorer, treasure hunters, colonists to a watery grave. It may be added that the disaster took place halfway across the ocean and not off Newfoundland, as the ballad relates. But for all this misfortune, England did not desist. The very next year, Raleigh, who had played on the sands with Humphrey Gilbert, sends his colonists to Roanoke and lays the foundation for the beginning of an empire in the southern states. English sailors explore Cape Cod. Ten years after Frobisher had brought home his cargo of worthless stones from Labrador, Davis, the master mariner, is out exploring the waters west of Greenland, and Henry Hudson, the English pilot who had discovered Hudson River, New York, for the Dutch, is retained by the English in 1610 to explore those waters west of Greenland where both Frobisher and Davis reported open passage. It is midsummer of 1610 when Hudson enters Hudson Straits. The ice jam of Ungava Bay, Labrador, has almost torn his ship's timbers apart and has set fear shivering like an aspen leaf among the crew. Old Jouette, the mate, rages openly at Hudson for venturing such a frail ship on such sea. But when the ship anchors at the west end of Hudson Straits, 500 miles from the Atlantic, there opens to view another sea, a sea large as the Mediterranean, that, like the Mediterranean, may lead to another world. It is as dangerous to go back as forward, and forward Hudson sails, southwestward for that sea Drake had cruised off California, the old mate's mutiny rumbling beneath the decks like a volcano. South, southwestward, 700 miles sails Hudson, past the high rocks and airy cataracts of Richmond Gulf, past silence like the realms of death, on down where Hudson Bay rounds into James Bay, and the shallows plainly show this is no way to a western sea, but a blind inlet, boulder strewn and muddy as swamps. When the ship runs aground and all hands must out to waste in ice water to pull her ashore as the tide comes in, Jouette's rage bursts all bounds. As they toil, snow begins to fall. They are winter-bound and storm-bound in an unknown land. Half the crew are in open mutiny. The other half build winter quarters and range the woods of James Bay for game. Of game there is plenty, but the rebels refuse to hunt. A worthless lad named Green, whom Hudson had picked off the streets of London, turns traitor and tale-bearer, fomenting open quarrels till the commander threatens he will hang to the yardarm the first man guilty of disobedience. So passes the sullen winter. Provisions are short when the ship weighs anchor for England in June of 1611. With tears in his eyes, Hudson hands out the last rations. Ice blocks the way. Delay means starvation. If the crew were only half as large, Henry Green whispers to the mutineers, there would be food enough for passage home. The ice flows clear and the sails swing, rattling to the breeze. But as Hudson steps on deck, the mutineers leap upon him like wolves. 
he is bound and thrown in the rowboat with him are thrust his son and eight others of the crew the rope is cut the rowboat jerks back adrift and hudson's vessel manned by the mutineers drives before the wind a few miles out the mutineers lower sails to rummage for food the little boat with the castaways is seen coming in pursuit guilt haunted the crew out with all sails and flee as avenging ghosts so passes henry hudson from the ken of all men though indian legend on the shores of hudson bay to this day maintains that the castaways landed north of rupert and lived among the savages end of section three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section four of canada the empire of the north this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc canada the empire of the north by agnes c lott from 1600 to 1607 part two not less disastrous were english efforts than french to colonize the new world up to 1610 canada's story is in the main a record of blind heroism dodged courage death that refused to acknowledge defeat 400 french vessels now yearly come to reap the harvest of the sea in and out among the fantastic rocks of gaspe pierced and pillared and scooped into caves by the wave wash where fisher boats reap other kind of harvest richer than the silver harvest of the sea harvest of beaver and otter and marten up the dim amber waters of the sanguinet within the shadow of the somber gorge trafficking baubles of bead and red print for furs precious furs pont grave merchant prince comes out with fifty men in sixteen hundred and leaves sixteen at tadasuk ostensibly as colonists really as wood loopers to scatter through the forests and learn the haunts of the indians point grave comes back for men and furs in sixteen one and comes again in sixteen o three with two vessels accompanied by a soldier of fortune from the french court who acts as geographer samuel champlain now in his thirty-sixth year with service in war to his credit and a journey across spanish america the two vessels are barely as large as coastal schooners but shallow draft enables them to essay the upper st lawrence as far as mount royal where cartier had voyaged of the palisaded indian fort not a vestige remains war or plague has driven the tribe westward but it is plain to the court geographer that in spite of former failures this land of rivers like lakes and valleys large as a european kingdoms is fit for french colonists when champlain returns to france the king readily grants to sieur de mont a region roughly defined as anywhere between pennsylvania and labrador designated acadia this region, Sieur de Mont, is to colonize in return for a monopoly of the fur trade. When other traders complain, de Mont quietens them by letting them all buy shares in the venture. With him are associated as motley a throng of treasure seekers as ever stampeded for gold. There is Samuel Champlain, the court geographer. There is Pont Grave, the merchant prince on a separate vessel with stores for the colonists. Pont Grave is to attend especially to the fur trading. There are the Baron de Pointencourt and his young son, Biencourt, and other noblemen looking for broader domains in the New World. And there are the usual riffraff of convicts taken from dungeons. Priests go to look after the souls of the Catholics, Huguenot ministers to care for the Protestants, and so valiantly do these dispute with tongues and fists that the sailors threaten to bury them in the same grave to see if they can lie at peace in death. Before the boats sight Acadia, it is summer of 1604, 
Pontgrave leaves stores with De Monts and sails up to Tadoussac. De Monts enters the little bay of St. Mary's off the northwest coast of Nova Scotia and sends his people ashore to explore. Signs of minerals they seek, rushing pell-mell through the woods, gleefully as boys out of school. The forest is pathless and dense with June undergrowth, shutting out the sun and all signs of direction. The company scatters. Priest Aubrey, more used to the cobble pavement of Paris than to the tangle of ferns, grows fatigue and drinks at a fresh water rill. Going in the direction of his comrades' voices, he suddenly realizes that he has left his sword at the spring. The priest hurries back for the sword, loses his companions' voices, and when he would return, finds that he is hopelessly lost. The last shafts of sunlight disappear. The chill of night settles on the darkening woods. The priest shouts till he is hoarse and fires off his pistol, but the woods muffle all sound but the scream of the wildcat or the uncanny hoot of the screech owl. Aubrey wanders desperately on and on in the dark, his cassock torn to tatters by the brushwood, his way blocked by the undisturbed windfall of countless ages. On and on, till gray dawn steals through the forest and midday wears to a second night. Back at the boat were wild alarm and wilder suspicions. Could the Huguenots, with whom Aubrey had battled so violently, have murdered him? De Mont scouted the notion of unworthy, but the suspicion clung in spite of fiercest denials. All night cannon were fired from the vessel and bonfires kept blazing on shore, but two or three days passed and the priest did not come. De Mont then sails on up the Bay of Fundy, which he calls French Bay, and the nearest chance shears through an opening 800 feet wide to the right and finds himself in the beautiful lake-like basin of Annapolis, broad enough to harbor all the French navy with a shoreline of wooded meadows like homeland parks. Point and Court is so delighted he at once asks for an estate here and names the domain Port Royal. On up Fundy Bay sails De Monts, Samuel Champagne ever leaning over decks, making those maps and drawings which have come down from that early voyage. The tides carry to a broad river on the north side. It is St. John's Day. They call the river St. John and wander ashore, looking vainly for more minerals. Westward is another river, known today as the St. Croix, the boundary between Maine and New Brunswick. Duché Island at its mouth seems to offer what to a soldier is an ideal site. A fort could command either Fundy Bay or the upland country, which Indians say leads back to the St. Lawrence. Thinking more of fort than farms, De Mont plants his colony on St. Croix River on an island composed mainly of sand and rock. While workmen labor to erect a fort on the north side, the pilot is sent back to Nova Scotia to prospect for minerals. As the vessel coasts near St. Mary's Bay, a black object is seen moving weakly along the shore. Sailors and pilot gaze in amazement. A hat on the end of the pole is waved weakly from the beach. The men scarcely believe their senses. It must be the priest though 16 days have passed since he disappeared. For two weeks, Aubrey had wandered, living on berries and roots before he found his way back to sea. Here, then, at last, is founded the first colony in Canada, a little palisaded fort of 79 men, straining longingly eyes of the sails of the vessel gliding out to sea for Pontgrave has taken one vessel up the St. Lawrence to trade, and Point Court has gone back to France with the other for supplies. The island was a little bigger than a sand heap. No hills shut out the cold winds that sweep down the river bed from the north, and the tide carried in ice jam from the south. 
as the snow began to fall, padding the stately forest with silence as of death, whitening the gaunt spruce trees somber as funeral mourners, the colonists felt the icy loneliness of winter in a forest chill their hearts. Cooped up on the island by the ice, they did little hunting. Idleness gave times for repinnings. Scurvy came, and before spring half the colonists had peopled the little cemetery outside the palisades. De Mont has had enough of St. Croix. When Pont Grey comes out with 40 more men in June, De Mont prepares to move. Champlain had the preceding autumn sailed south, seeking a better site. And now with De Mont, he sails south again, far as Cape Cod, looking for a place to plant the capital of New France. It is amusing to speculate that Canada might have included as far south as Boston, if they had found a harbor to their liking, but they saw nothing to compare with Annapolis Basin, narrow of entrance, landlocked, placid as a lake, with shores wooded like a park, and back they cruised to St. Croix in August to move the colony across to Nova Scotia, to Annapolis Basin of Acadia. While Champagne and Pontgray volunteer to winter in the wilderness, De Mont goes home to look after his monopoly in France. What had de Mont to show for his two years' labor? His company had spent what would be $20,000 in modern money, and all returns from fur trade had been swallowed up, prolonging the colony. While Champlain hunted moose in the woods around Port Royal and Pontgrave bartered furs during the winter of 1605, to 1606, de Mont and Poincourt and the gay lawyer Marc Lecarbeau fight for the life of the monopoly in Paris and point out to the clamorous merchants that the building of a French empire in the New World is of more importance than paltry profits. De Mont remains in France to stem the tide rising against him, while Poincourt and Lecarbeau sail on the Jonas with more colonists and supplies for Port Royal. Noon, July 27, 1606, the ship slips into the basin of Annapolis. To Lake Carbeau, the poet lawyer, the scene is fairyland, the silver flood of the harbor motionless as glass, the wooded meadows dank with bloom, the air odorous of woodland smells, the blue hills rimming round the sky, and against the woods of the north shore, the chapel spire, and thatch roofs and slab walls of the little fort, the one oasis of life in a wilderness. As the sails rattled down and the anchor dropped, not a soul appeared from the fort. The gates are bolted fast. The Jonas runs up the French ensign. Then a canoe shoots out from the brushwood, paddled by the old chief, member two. He signals back to the watchers behind the gates. Muskerty shots ring out welcome. The ship's cannon answer, setting the waters churning. Trumpets blare, the gates fly wide, and out marches the garrison, two lone Frenchmen. The rest, despairing of a ship that summer, have cruised along Cape Breton to obtain supplies from French fishermen, whence, presently, come Pontgrave and Champlain, overjoyed to find the ship from France. Poincourt has hog's head of wine rolled to the courtyard, and all hands fitly celebrate. When Pontgrave carries the furs to France, Marc Lake Carbeau, the lawyer poet, proves the life of the fort for this, the third winter of the colonists in Acadia. Poincourt and his son attend to trade. Champlain, as usual, commands, and dull care is chased away by a thousand pranks of the Paris advocate. First, he sets the whole fort a-gardening, and Baron Poincourt forgets his noblesse long enough to wield the hoe. Then Champagne must dam up the brook for a trout pond. The weather is almost mild as summer until January. The woods ring to many a merry picnic, fishing excursion, or moose hunt. And when snow comes, the gayless Carbot 
along with Champlain, institutes a new world order of nobility, the order of good times. Each day, one of the number must canter to the mess room table of the fort. This means keen hunting, keen rivalry for one to outdo another in the giving of scumptious feasts. And all is done with the pomp and ceremony of a court banquet. When the chapel bell rings out noon hour and workers file to the long table, there stands the master of the revels, napkin on shoulder, chain of honor around his neck, truncheon in his hand. The gavel strikes, and there enter the brotherhood, each bearing a steaming dish in his hand. Moose hump, beaver tail, bear's paws, wild fowl smelling luscious as food smells only to out-of-doors men. Old chief member two dines with the whites. Crouching round the wall behind the benches are squaws and the children, to whom are flung many a tasty bit. At night time, round the hearth fire, when the roaring logs set the shadows dancing on the rough timbered wall, the truncheon and chain of command are pompously transferred to the new grand master. It is all child's play, but it keeps the blood of grown men coursing hopefully or else Le Carbeau perpetuates a newspaper, a handwritten sheet giving the doings of the day, perhaps in dog verse of his own composing. At other times, trumpets and drums and pipes keep time to a dance. As all the warring clergymen, both Huguenot and Catholic, have died of scurvy, Le Carbeau acts as priest on Sundays and winds up the day with cheerful excursions up the river or supper spread on the green. The lawyer's good spirits prove contagious. The French songs that rang through the woods of Arcadia, keeping time to the chopper's labors, were the best antidote to scurvy. But the wildwood happiness was too good to last. While Le Scarbeau was writing his history of the new colonies, a bolt fell from the blue. Instead of de Mont's vessel, there came in spring a fishing smack with word that the grant of Acadia had been rescinded. No more money would be advanced. Poincourt and his son, Bincourt, resolved to come back without the support of a company. But for the present, all took sad leave of the little settlement. Poincourt, Champlain, Le Carbeau, and sailed with the Cape Breton fishing fleet for France, where they landed in October 1607. Cartier, Roberval, La Roche, de Mont, all had failed to establish France in Canada. And as for England, Sir Humphrey's colonists lay bleaching skeletons at the bottom of the sea. End of section four. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.